Welcome everyone. It's great to have you here today for our latest installment in the GNEM Symposium Speaker Series presented by the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation. This is always a great uh, opportunity for the patient community and, uh, and different investigators who work on GNEM to, uh, to hear about recent results that have been generated in uh, some of the laboratories uh, supported by the, uh, by the NDF. Uh, and today we have a really great uh, seminar that will be presented by Dr. Paul Martin. Uh, he's a principal investigator in the Center for Gene Therapy at the uh, Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital here in Columbus, Ohio. He's also a professor of pediatrics and a professor of physiology and biology uh, at Ohio State as well. He also serves as the associate director for the NIH Center for Research Translation and Muscular, Dystro uh, Muscular Dystrophy Therapeutic Development, which is also a resident at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, I've known Paul for a number of years, and he's done some really seminal work as it relates to glycobiology and how that contributes to the progression of various types of neuromuscular disease. Uh, obviously, that's an important component of how GNEM develops. So it's really great to have him here today to talk about the research that he's been doing in his lab, pushing towards uh, both a potency element, uh, potency assay uh, for uh, measuring the efficacy of gene therapies in GNE myopathy, and also a, a disease model for GNEM that he's developing in his lab, which will be very important component for research that takes place uh, throughout uh, the GNEM field. So. Uh, exciting to have Paul here today. I'll turn it over to you, and we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Noah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, share with you some of the results that we've developed over the past year uh, with our funding from the NDF. And uh, so I will just take over here and get started. Um, First of all, I have financial conflicts of interest to disclose with these companies. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, you know, I am uh, the head of the lab, but I don't really do any of the lab work. So <laughs> I need to give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, the researchers in my lab whose work I'm going to present today are Deborah Zygmunt who um, developed the potency assays I'm going to talk about, Anna Ashbrook, who um, helped develop um, aspects of gene dosing, uh, Dr. Patricia Lamb, who developed AAV vectors uh, for g and &E myopathy, and also um, worked on both of those projects. And then I'm going to touch on a few experiments that Dr. Kelly Crow did when she was um, a graduate student in the lab. Uh, I'll briefly talk about that work. Um, and she's now a professor at Xavier University. Um, I've had a number of collaborators on these projects. Um, uh, for making inducible knockout mice, we worked with the mouse biology program at UC Davis, and Joshua Wood uh, pioneered our work uh, on uh, making this mouse. Uh, Pamela Stanley at Albert Einstein University in New York City. Um, gave us g &E deficient cells called LEC3 cells that we used uh, for the potency assay. At Genethon, a uh, biotech company in France, gave us a uh, plasmid to induce MyoD in those cells. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this work today, but Moncal and Angela Leck have uh, given us g &E deficient muscle cells, which um, we will be uh, studying as well. Uh, Louise Rodina Claypack and Kristen Heller um, did some muscle physiology for us uh, on uh, uh, one of the mouse models that I'll talk about. And Dr. Nishino and Noguchi uh, were very kind in giving us um, one of the g &E myopathy mouse models to study. Um, so again, uh, thank you for funding from the NDF. Uh, funding also has come from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, technology Development Fund uh, from the state of Ohio and from the Musculoskeletal Institute at the NIH. So uh, for this audience, I probably don't need to, to go into this too much, but uh, it's important to say that g &E myopathy is caused by mutations uh, in the g and &E gene, and that work, with, of course, was um, uh, first discovered in the classic Nature Genetics paper by Stella Mitrani Rosenbaum and colleagues uh, back in 2001. 
And the general uh, consensus uh, is that those mutations, uh, which are missense mutations in GE, um, affect the function of the GE protein in making sialic acid. Uh, so GE has two enzymatic steps it's a bifunctional enzyme, it epimerizes EDP gluconic uh, to MANAC and then phosphorylates that MANAC to make MANAC 6 kinase. And without these steps, you can't feed. Um, into the sialic acid biosynthesis pathway from glucose uh, and make sialic acid. When sialic acid is made, it's converted to a sugar a nucleotide donor, uh, which then sial transferases use uh, to transfer sialic acid to lipids and to proteins in the cell. So uh, this is kind of a, a complex slide, but my point here is to show that of the uh, eight common sugars that, that mammalian glycoproteins and glycolipids have. Uh, sialic acid here is this uh, purple diamond, and it exists typically on the ends of glycan chains, on uh, N-linked proteins, and also on O-linked proteins, which you can see here, as well as on uh, certain glycolipids. Uh, so it is uh, ubiquitous uh, on proteins and lipids in cells, although obviously not on all of them. Uh, and uh, it can have many, many uh, functions as a result of that. So for example, uh, there are predicted to be 10,000 N-linked glycoproteins uh, in a typical cell. And so most of those, if not all of them, would then have sialic acid on them, which could affect the rate at which they're secreted their protein stability, their protein folding, their ability to interact with other proteins, uh, and uh, uh, their ability to signal. Uh, so, so sialic acid is, is central to, to many, many components of cell biology uh, as a terminal glycan uh, on proteins and lipids. Uh, so g and &E myopathy is caused typically by missense mutations in, in the g and &E proteins, so converting one amino acid to another amino acid, and those uh, amino acid substitutions then lead uh, to uh, causing disease. Um, so uh, you cannot uh, live, at least uh, if you're a mammal, without g and &E. um, so sialic acid is present on all cells in the body, uh, and GE is expressed in, in all cells as well. And, and so uh, these missense mutations allow for a protein to be made, uh, but a protein that is not uh, functional in its normal way. Um, there are uh, several thousand patients known to have GE myopathy worldwide, but uh, recent studies of genetic databases looking at uh, for mutations, uh, human mutations uh, that are causative for g and &E myopathy suggests that there might be as many as 40,000 uh, patients in the world, uh, many of which are not diagnosed uh, uh, properly. And so there may be as many as 3,000 uh, patients in North America, 4,000 in Europe, and some 13,000 in Asia. And of course, certain uh, populations uh, have a higher frequency of disease-causing mutations. This is a publication by my friend and colleague, Guidon Ackler, uh, who's a geneticist who studies, um, amongst other things, g and &E myopathy, uh, who showed that in the New York population of Iranian Jews, uh, the carrier mutation can be as high as one in eight for disease-causing mutations. So obviously, a much greater impact uh, on, on that population. Uh, this I stole this slide from Dr. Noguchi's book, uh, our, our article, uh, to show what the muscles look like when uh, the disease happens. And uh, this is an H&E stain, and that the arrow shows the presence of an occlusion body within the muscle. And this is one of the hallmarks of the disease, our intramuscular inclusions. And um, that's an important um, uh, thing that I'm going to talk about a little bit later um, when we talk about disease models. 
The other hallmark of the disease is muscle wasting. So this is an example of an axial T1 weighted MRI of um, legs from uh, patients at different stages of disease. And then down here, you see a cross section from the upper leg and a cross section from the lower leg. And uh, these, these uh, darkened areas are, are muscle. And as you can see, as the disease progresses, um, these muscles disappear uh, from the leg in these regions. Uh, the quadriceps muscle is generally disappears more slowly than other muscles, uh, thus uh, the original name for the disease, quadriceps sparing myopathy. Uh, but one of the hallmarks of the disease is that uh, muscle is replaced by fat or extracellular matrix and what we um, refer to generally as muscle wasting. And that's a very important uh, also component to be, want to be able to model in the disease because um, it is very similar to what one sees with uh, different forms of muscular dystrophy. And in those forms of muscular dystrophy, um, the, the, the wasting often uh, is uh, attributed to uh, deficits in muscle regeneration. And so we don't really know a whole lot about muscle regeneration in GNE myopathy but it is not uncommon uh, and wouldn't be a surprise to think that regeneration of the muscle, which typically can, um, when a muscle is damaged, it typically can regenerate a new, new muscle in its stead um, um, for that process to be defective uh, in, in the disease. Um, recent mutation studies, including, um, we, we just had an example of a patient here at Nationwide Children's uh, with juvenile amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis or motor neuron disease, uh, where their complete genome sequencing um, suggested that GE mu mutations were causative. And there are other publications uh, that, that are similar in this respect. Uh, that are out there in the literature. And so it's important to realize that GNE, which is expressed in all of the cells of the body, uh, might, uh, when mutated, give rise to conditions that affect uh, tissues besides muscle, in particular uh, motor neurons, which of course are connected to muscle and which the brain uses to tell muscles to move. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, creating therapies for GNE myopathy, it's important to realize that um, one might want to also address uh, these other uh, disease forms that are also attributed to mutations in the GE gene. So, my lab's a gene therapy lab. We develop uh, therapeutics for patients uh, with muscular uh, dystrophies and other muscle diseases, and also lysosomal storage disorders. And uh, so what we do is we take a virus uh, called adeno-associated virus, which is a virus that doesn't cause any disease in humans, but um, infects cells very well. And we take the, the one piece of, so all that virus is, is a, a giant protein capsid, which is this blue thing here. And it has a single piece of DNA in it. And we take that piece of DNA out through engineering and then substitute it with uh, the gene uh, that we want to replace in, in the disease. And then that virus protein, the capsid, is then used as a cargo carrier uh, to deliver that new gene to, to cells in patients. Uh, and so the way this works is that you can just inject this virus into the blood. It binds to the membranes of cells and is internalized, docks with the nucleus, and then uh, delivers that gene medicine uh, to uh, the cell in a way that it can express the gene, a normal copy of the gene that is mutated in the disease. So um, that seems very simple, uh, but there are a lot of things one has to do in order to make that gene therapy work well. Um, and uh, and there are a lot of questions that one has to answer. Uh, the most important of these are where should we express the gene? Uh, and so depending on uh, how you want to deliver it, there can be different serotypes that are used. 
And there can also be different promoters that express the gene specifically in certain tissues. Uh, for GNE myopathy, since the GNE gene is expressed in all tissues, I mean, that is a big question for the development of therapeutics is should it be expressed in all tissues or should it just be expressed in muscle where the primary disease is occurring? And, and that's a question I'd like to touch on a little bit today. Um, uh, and then how do we define uh, the function and the efficacy of that gene therapy? So to do that, we need model systems. And usually these are animal models like mouse models where the disease occurs and can be shown to be fixed by the gene therapy and where there are specific functional changes that can be assayed uh, that are relevant to the disease. Uh, for example, muscle function in this case. Um, and then potency, like how, how much of this uh, therapy do we need to give? Uh, you obviously want to give only the amount that is needed to, to deliver a full therapeutic response and no more than that because of uh, safety issues with delivering uh, the gene therapy. And then you also want to know, um, is, it, is it working? And if it is working, is it uh, working as well as it did last year? Is it a, a stability of the gene therapy uh, the same as you store it over time? So these are questions the FDA needs answers to in order for a gene therapy to move forward in a clinical trial. Um, so can we define dose? I'm going to talk about a little bit about that today. Can we define safety? Uh, I'm not going to touch on that, although um, we have some data in that regard. And then uh, last, uh, is gene replacement a, of a single gene enough? Uh, and this is something that my lab has focused a lot on lately, uh, because if you are going to provide uh, a gene, a normal copy of a gene to a patient that has a diseased gene uh, that will in effect stop the disease from uh, developing further, uh, but will it be able to take you back to where you were before the disease started? Uh, that usually is the answer to that is no. And so there are other technologies that I think need to be brought to bear on muscle diseases um, in order for that to happen. And that's a real focus of our lab. And I won't really be getting into that today, but um, that is uh, you know, work for the future. So to make a gene therapy, we simply remove the, the viral genome and then we put back uh, a normal copy of, of a gene in case this case, the human GNE gene with a promoter. And the only part of the original uh, DNA from the virus that we leave are these two little red patches at the end, which are the uh, inverted terminal repeats. And these allow that piece of DNA to be packaged in the viral capsule. So we take out the, the viral genome, which is just two genes, the rep and the cap gene, but we'll add these back in trans along with some adenovirus associated per, uh, adenovirus proteins, which are needed for the virus uh, to replicate. Uh, these are then transfected into a human cell called an HEK293 cell. And what comes out then is, is a virus with the therapeutic gene uh, packaged instead of the normal viral genome. And this is what these viruses look like. They're little 20 nanometer um, therapeutics. Uh, so they're very small and uh, they can be purified to very high purity uh, in the lab. And uh, you see here uh, one little dense particle that, that has a DNA piece packaged into it. And then here's another uh, viral particle where there's no DNA packaged into it. So one needs to separate out those two elements and purify for the package material. When one does that and then runs a gel, uh, you can get a, a protein a profile that only shows the capsid protein, which exists in three forms, VP3, VP2, and VP1 in a 10 to 1 to 1 ratio. And, and that virus can be purified to well above 99% um, purity. So once we've done this, uh, obviously, uh, we then need to see if it works. And so that's what a potency assay does for you. It, it tells you, okay, I've got the normal copy of the gene in here, uh, but does it really make sialic acid? And if it does make sialic acid and I put it in the freezer and um, 
I come back a year later and thaw it out and want to use it again, is it as good as it was when I, were, I originally made it? And so that's a question of stability. And those two things have to be uh, demonstrated for every uh, AAV that is made for human use. And they need to be uh, uh, characterized for stability over a number of years, uh, and certainly uh, certainly over the number as many years as one would need to use up all the material that one had made in patients. Uh, and so this this stability test becomes really important um, to to have working in the lab, and it also has to be a, an assay that's fairly fast. Uh, when we originally um, got an IND to test a gene therapy in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we had a, a, an assay for potency and stability that involved injecting mice, and it took an entire month for us to assay. Uh, how well the virus was working. Uh, and once we started to develop and uh, produce uh, that virus for uh, human patients, uh, what we found is we had to make multiple lots of the virus in order to get enough virus uh, to use. And so for each of those lots then, we're, we were doing these one month assays uh, every year uh, for multiple years. And, and so it becomes, for an academic lab, certainly a, it's a very onerous and time-consuming process then if you have uh, all of these assays that you have to do all the time. So doing assays in cells is much easier, and um, uh, I, that's what I'm going to talk about um, developing today. So we took advantage of cells that don't make GNE functionally, and those are LEC3 cells, which were originally described um, by Pamela Stanley. These are ch Cho cells or Chinese hamster ovary cells that have been mutated uh, so that the G and E gene is inactive. And when we use a lectin that recognizes sialic acid, if you look at the normal Cho cells here, there's a staining here in red. And if you look at that same lectin staining in LEC3 cells, uh, you can see over here that there, there's no staining at all. And if you then transfect the normal human gene back into those LEC3 cells, the staining comes back for the sialic acid, and you can see the expression of the human protein in the cells. So, so this kind of assay is, is uh, very clean and very clear, and that's the kind of thing you want uh, if you want to um, be doing these assays to test and compare viral vectors to one another, and also to test their efficacy over time. Um, so the other thing I need to tell you about this is that if you grew these LEC3 cells in serum containing media, um, it would just stain like the Cho cells. So there's a lot of sialic acid in serum and a lot of glycoproteins that have sialic acid in serum. And so if you uh, grow GE deficient cells in the presence of serum, uh, they take that sialic acid up and then express it on their surface and you can't see the deficit. So you have to starve the cells for serum for five days in order to get this difference to occur. Uh, so, so that's a very important part of the process that Deborah figured out uh, and um, optimized uh, for this assay. Uh, then what we do uh, is take those LEC3 cells and add different amounts of uh, virus, uh, in this case, a g and &E expressing AAV, uh, that uses a constitutive promoter uh, taken uh, from the cytomegalovirus. Uh, so this is a promoter that can express the gene in all cells, uh, and it expresses then a normal human copy of the GE &E gene. And what we do is add different amounts of the virus to the cells, and we can see an increase in the potency uh, of the virus. And by potency, what we mean is we get a sialic acid lectin binding that is equivalent to what we would see in a normal Cho cell uh, uh, with, which has a normal copy of the g and &E gene. So MOI here uh, refers to multiplicity of infection. And what that uh, means is that uh, you, a 10 to, 4, 10 to the 4 MOI would mean we're adding uh, 10,000 virions for every cell that is in the assay. And you're saying to yourself right now, well, that seems like a lot of virions to add to a cell to get it to be infected. And that is one of the things about AAV that is um, sort of notorious is that it is very poor at infecting cells in culture. 
whereas it's very good at infecting cells in vivo. Um, so that's just, just a, an artifact of the fact that this virus works in that way. But we can still use uh, different doses to define uh, how much we uh, need to get full potency uh, in this way. And that's the most important um, thing um, for this kind of assay. So that will work with the constitutive promoter. So ch Cho cells are Chinese hamster ovary cells. So they're not muscle cells. So muscle specific promoters don't work that well in these cells. Uh, so in order to make them work better, uh, we uh, modified the cells by transfecting in a plasmid that can induce the expression of MyoD. So MyoD is a transcription factor that it's a master regulator of muscle genes and it's a master uh, regulator of muscle development. So it's a transcription factor, and uh, the g and &E promoter has uh, 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 my, uh, the, the, the promoters that are muscle specific have binding sites for MyoD on their promoters. And so when MyoD is expressed, you can um, assay those promoters more easily. So this is just an example. This is an inducible plasmid. So you can add doxycycline to turn the MyoD on. In the absence of doxycycline, it is not expressed. And uh, so if you turn it on for one or two or three days, you can see the MyoD light up here. And on a Western blot, you can see the native molecular weight of the MyoD protein uh, is expressed uh, stably. Uh, there's also a proteolytic fragment that exists in the untransduced cells, uh, which is not functional, uh, and, and that, that is also induced um, uh, with doxycycline. So as you can see, there's a variability here to how much is expressed in the cells when we batch selected them uh, with an antibiotic re resistance gene. Uh, and so uh, we then cloned out single cells and uh, I repurified re them so that we could have a more uniform response. Uh, and uh, those uh, cells then, there are different lines shown here in the presence of doxycycline and in the absence. When you clone out those single cells, you tend to see a little bit of myOD expression even in the absence of doxycycline. And that's because these inducible uh, plasmids for myOD are a little bit leaky, uh, but you obviously get vastly more when you when you turn the gene on and you can see uh, ubiquitous pink staining in the, in the cells then in the nuclei uh, so now in in addition to cmv we could induce uh, and see a dose response curve uh, when we put uh, different muscle specific promoters on the g and e gene that we're using for uh, the gene therapy including mck which is muscle creatine kinase promoter and a variant of that called MHCK7, which has an additional enhancer in it. And now um, here's CMV, uh, here's MHCK7, and here's MCK. Uh, when uh, MyOD is turned on, you can see uh, expression of all three of those. Um, so uh, we are we sent this in for publication, and the reviewers came back and they said, you know, this is really interesting, but why don't you try this in muscle cells that are deficient in GNE? And uh, they didn't really understand that that's not really required for a potency assay, um, but we were able to get GNE deficient human muscle cells from the LEC lab. They had deleted GNE in those cells, and we're trying to uh, reproduce these results in those cells as well. Of course, you have to starve these cells for serum in order to get uh, they're, in order to be able to see a difference in salic acid content and uh, muscle cells can't be starved for serum unless you induce differentiation um, because they'll drop out of the cell cycle. So it, it's a you know pretty challenging thing to try to do this, but we are trying to um, develop this now uh, so that we can have um, yet another assay uh, uh, for AAB potency. So the question then becomes, well, if you can show that g &E works to make sialic acid, uh, how much do you need to put into uh, the muscle uh, to replace uh, the normal amount of uh, g &E that was there? Uh, and so this is just a, a, an experiment where we've shown uh, how much 
uh, mouse gene, ex gene expression is expressed in wild type mice. And we've normalized expression to uh, expression in the liver, which we've set at one. And what you can see is in these different skeletal muscles, the quadriceps, the gastrocnemius, the triceps, the tibialis anterior, these are all limb muscles, um, that there's very, very low expression of G and E gene. Uh, and so it's 11.7 times lower in the muscle than it is in the liver. And so that might help to explain why mutations in GNE uh, give rise to a primarily muscle specific disease, because um, GNE is expressed at the lowest levels in skeletal muscles uh, relative to other tissues in the body. Um, in the diaphragm and the heart, there's slightly more gene expression. Uh, and likewise in other organs, and of course, here in the colon, it's, there's, there's quite a lot. Um, and so what we wanted to do is ask, well, if we could just do intravenous dosing of uh, G&E, uh, an AAV vector, a gene therapy vector with normal human G&E, could we figure out what dose we would need to get this amount of gene expression in uh, different skeletal muscles? In other words, could we dose these mice so that we have a ratio of human g &E to mouse g &E that's one to one. If that's the case, then what you have is complete replacement of what would be normal gene expression with now with human gene expression coming from the AAV virus. So um, Patricia developed uh, primer probe sets uh, for human g &E and for mouse g &E. And then we took different amounts of the mouse or the human gene, and we asked, do they respond in the same way in terms of giving signal uh, to, to their uh, input? And the answer was yes. And then the mouse G and E gene doesn't recognize the human gene, the human G and E gene at all, and the human G and E primers don't recognize the mouse G and E gene at all. And so what we could do then is use these uh, oligonucleotides to compare gene expression for the mouse and the human gene. Uh, and we then reference that to ribosomal 18 sRNA within the experiment. And so we did intravenous dosing of wild type mice then with uh, human G&E um, with uh, different promoters. Uh, so it's a CMV is a constitutive promoter, MCK is a muscle specific promoter, and MHCK7 is a slightly stronger muscle specific promoter. And we used fairly high doses of uh, AAV vector here and looked in the gastrocnemius, which is a limb muscle, in the heart, and in the liver. And obviously at, at, at 1 times 10 to the 14th, which is the, uh, about the dose that is used for microdystrophin gene therapy in patients with Duchenne, or for SMA patients uh, with Zolgensma, uh, you can see that you deliver uh, an unnecessarily large amount of gene therapy to the muscle. So CMV is delivering 50 times the normal level of gene expression to the muscle. Uh, and even down at 3.3 times 10 to the 13th per kilogram, MCK is delivering a one-to-one -one ratio here, but CMV and MHCK7, which are stronger, are delivering uh, higher levels than are needed to get one-to-one -one gene replacement. So we then expanded these studies and uh, went down in dose uh, to two and to one times 10 to the 13th. And we expanded the number of muscles that we were looking at as well, uh, looking at now four limb muscles, as well as the diaphragm. And this bold column in the middle here, the average of all muscles, what I want you to focus on, uh, where we just uh, took all five muscles and we averaged the data together to ask, you know, what is the general response in the muscles throughout the body? So down at one times 10 to the 13th, both CMV and MHCK7 uh, yielded that sort of magic one-to-one -one ratio uh, of gene therapy uh, to endogenous gene uh, expression, uh, whereas MCK was about 10 times um, lower than what we would hope for. Um, these promoters also induce expression in the heart. Um, and uh, so you have some overexpression in the heart, but surprisingly, because the liver gene expression is so much higher, they only give a 20 to 40% elevation in the normal level of gene expression in the liver. 
which is important because the liver is a primary target for uh, genotoxicity in uh, AAB therapies. And then other organs had, had very, very low levels of gene expression relative to their natural level. So this is an important experiment, I think, because it really suggests that if you're using a strong promoter for GNE, you might be able to get away with a dose as low as 1 times 10 to the 13th in patients. And this is a dose that's about 10 times lower than the doses that are currently being used to treat uh, muscle diseases with gene therapy. And of course, if one can do that, then uh, manufacturing becomes a little simpler and uh, safety becomes uh, significantly better in terms of the amount that you have to give to get a therapeutic response. So the next step then is to figure out what, uh, how to show that you can cure the disease with uh, an animal model. And this has been a problem in the field for a while and uh, is, a, is a significant challenge. Um, so as you all probably know, there are certain disease mutations that have been modeled in mice. Uh, there's an M uh, to T knock-in model, uh, which can lead to early perinatal lethality because of kidney disease, which is an aspect of mouse biology that's just fundamentally different than human biology. Uh, for this disease. And then uh, the Nishina Noguchi model, where gene deficient mice are rescued with a transgene uh, for the human gene, which carries a, a founder mutation that is um, common in the a Japanese population. Uh, so they were kind enough to give us that model. And uh, just to show you a pub uh, aspect from the publications, uh, these mice uh, originally were described as having muscle weakness from eight months of age, uh, also intramuscular inclusions, and to show a deficit in survival uh, uh, and a reduction in muscle size um, within a year. Um, unfortunately, uh, our lab and others have found that with continued breeding, uh, this phenotype has really uh, been uh, reduced and delayed in the mice and what we found with, uh, this is work from Kelly Crow's uh, paper, is that the muscle uh, size really showed no difference even at 15 months here. Uh, and also muscle strength uh, was uh, not significantly reduced. It was reduced a tiny little bit, but this was not enough to show a significant difference. If we looked at force drop during repeated eccentric contractions, which is another measure of muscle damage uh, during injury, uh, we found, again, uh, no significant difference between these two. Keep in mind here, we're, we're plotting here uh, only down to a 60% deficit just to bring out this difference uh, a little bit. It should really go down to zero. And when you plot these uh, from a one to zero, uh, this, this difference looks even, even smaller. So the point is that um, while these mice might still be a good model for the disease, it will take a very, very long time to see uh, significant differences between normal mice and diseased mice. And again, uh, by 15 months, we also saw no evidence of muscle damage in any of the lines we made. Uh, and this is Congo red staining, and uh, which typically will give you a uh, red uh, for intramuscular inclusion bodies. Uh, this is just a positive control from a, an Alzheimer's disease mouse you know, where they stain the amyloid plaques. And we really didn't see any evidence uh, for inclusion bodies or for, for muscle damage. So um, as you all probably know, uh, if you delete g &E from conception, and this has been published uh, in a classic paper, uh, several decades ago, um, mice cannot be born alive. So, so you need g &E, uh, for embryogenesis uh, and uh, for survival. Uh, so a knockout mouse uh, from, from birth, I mean, from conception, uh, is not a viable model to use. Uh, so we wanted to make an inducible gene knockout mouse uh, to see if we could study uh, g &E gene function in the adult animal to ask the question, well, 
if, if this is a loss of function disease, then when you knock G and E out in muscle or in the whole body, you should be able to see that disease happening. And that might be more robust than expressing uh, a mutant transgene. So we worked with UC Davis to do this. It took a long, long time. And I'm not going to tell you about any of that because uh, we just did it. And, um, and so now we have, uh, in, in, in use, using Cas CRISPR, we've introduced uh, LOX-P sites on either side of exon 3 in the mouse genie gene. And uh, uh, that allows us to express the Cree recombinase and induce gene deletion uh, to uh, create a knockout of the gene. I'm going to tell you the very beginnings of two sets of experiments, one where we injected Cree with a GFP fusion protein, either using a constitutive promoter or a muscle-specific promoter to knock the genes out in uh, the skeletal muscles of uh, floxed mice. And then I'm going to talk uh, just very briefly about inducible transgenic mice, where you can use tamoxifen to induce uh, functional Cree uh, gene deletion uh, as well. So the first thing to know about this is that um, if you delete exon 3 from mice, uh, you don't end up with any viable animals. So we were able to replicate uh, the original studies of uh, g and &E de gene deletion being uh, essential uh, for uh, viability. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, encouraging and um, definitely suggested that that was uh, that exon 3 was a gene exon that we could target uh, where we would eliminate g and &E function. All right, I uh, lost my ability to move the screen. There we go. Um, so what what happens when you put these lox p sites around that exon then is when Cree is introduced, uh, it deletes uh, that exon from from the cell, uh, from the genome, uh, uh, leave, leaving a smaller uh, piece of DNA. So, and to do these experiments, it's important to remember that muscle cells are um, complicated. They're myofibers made of many hundreds of nuclei, uh, and when you uh, damage those muscles. There are stem cells that exist uh, along the sides of those muscles that can replicate, make new myoblasts, and make a new regenerated myofiber um, in its place. So if you knock out, if you use a myofiber-specific promoter to knock out GNE, you would knock it out in this myofiber, but when it was regenerated, these cells that weren't knocked out would then make a cell that had GNE again until uh, the the Cree was turned back on. And so you, you end up with this sort of uh, chronic cycle where uh, you're not completely deleting g and &E from the process. Whereas if you use a constitutive promoter that targets both of these cell types, uh, as these cells regenerate, they also lack g and &E and uh, then make a muscle that is g and &E deficient. So it's important to realize that there are these two sorts of mechanisms that can happen. And so what we did was we started with lox lox uh, uh, mice, and we injected muscles directly with uh, in a, a, a Cree-expressing AAV that could either knock out expression just in the myofiber or in all of the cells. Oops. So this is an example, uh, and then you know the other thing is is that uh, when you do that, uh, you really want to do it every every two weeks because it takes two weeks for a myofiber to regenerate, uh, and so what you'd like to do is put Cree back into the system uh, every time there's a chance for regeneration. So we did an experiment where we injected uh, mice in muscles directly at two weeks of age. And then every two weeks thereafter for a total of 12 weeks. So they got six injections with a, a G, an AAV vector that expresses Cree in all of the cells that it enters. So this is a little complicated, but we used uh, multiple sets of oligonucleotides uh, to look at both the genotype and the gene deletion. Uh, and all you need to really know about this is that this little band down here is the wild type band. And then if there's a second band up here, 
where'd my pointer go? Uh, you have a LOX P site. And then if you only have that band up there, you have two LOX P sites. Uh, and so when we injected AAV, uh, you can then see that we create a new deleted band here. And then this wild type band uh, becomes less uh, prominent as well. Uh, so when we did this experiment and we injected the TA muscle, the gastrocnemius muscle, and the quadriceps muscle, uh, we could induce a very strong gene deletion in each of these muscles. Because RH74, the AAV serotype we used, crosses the blood brain, the, the vascular barrier very easily. Even if you inject it into a muscle, some gets out into the blood and goes into other organs. And in this case, uh, because AAV loves to go to the liver more than it loves to go to the muscle, we actually deleted uh, gene expression in the liver even more strongly than we did in the muscle, even though we were injecting the virus directly into the muscles. So this is an example of uh, gene expression uh, measures. Uh, where we compared IM injected and uh, CMV injected Cre AAV vectors. And what you can see is in the TA and in the gastroc and in the quad, we're getting about the same level of knockdown of gene expression uh, in each muscle. Uh, maybe CMV is a little bit stronger, but it's uh, basically we're in the 20 to 35% uh, of normal range. So in each of these muscles, we're calling normal one and then we're comparing uh, the level of gene expression we got when we put the AAV vector in there. In liver, where CMV is expressed, we got a very strong knockdown of gene expression, and MCK, which uh, does not express well in liver, uh, did not do that. So the take-home message here is that by three or four months of doing this, uh, and we have mice at each of these conditions, and they really show sort of the same uh, pattern uh, in the gastroc and in the TA and in the quad. We have almost 100% muscle damage um, uh, at, this, at this age. Uh, so you can see small regenerating fibers occurring. You can see central nuclei, which are a sign that a muscle cell has undergone degeneration and regeneration. I don't have any here, but we can see um, uh, 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 damaged fibers as well uh, with this staining. Uh, but what you don't see is any muscle wasting and you uh, see very little inflammation uh, or mononuclear cells in large aggregates. And uh, we saw no evidence of inclusion bodies. So this is an important experiment in that it really shows that deleting GNE from the muscle can uh, induce disease. Uh, so loss of GE function uh, can cause uh, disease in muscle. Um, but I think it opens as many questions as it answers because um, we still do not know um, uh, the extent to which loss of function causes uh, all of the all of the phenotypes that we see in a muscle in the muscle disease. Uh, in particular, we don't see yet muscle wasting and we don't see any evidence of inclusion bodies. So this is just Congo red staining to show you in those muscles uh, that there's no um, uh, intracellular aggregates. Uh, this is a positive control from a cerebellum of an Alzheimer's disease mouse. Uh, and so, you know, the question then is, uh, what, else, what else could be going on? Uh, could the expression of the mutant protein be the thing that's causing uh, inclusion bodies. Uh, we can certainly test that in these mice uh, by reintroducing a, a single copy of uh, the mutated protein. Uh, and then uh, does this uh, develop further uh, as time goes on? Uh, so are we going to see more severe disease uh, as we extend this experiment uh, further? Now, if you use a muscle-specific promoter and do the exact same experiment, uh, you really see almost no disease. Um, so myofibers, knocking g &E out in myofibers, which I showed you the RNA expression for before, is equivalent roughly to the CMV, um, shows very little uh, muscle damage. So uh, this also opens as many questions as we've answered, uh, but it really asks the question, um, do we really uh, need to see deficits in g &E in non-muscle organs in order to see muscle damage? And, um, 
we, do we really need to see uh, deletion in muscle stem cells in order to see aspects of, of muscle regeneration um, be deficient? Um, so uh, we also have a constitutive uh, inducible Cree mouse. So this is a mouse that has a constitutive promoter called Rosa 26, uh, which expresses a Cree uh, estrogen receptor fusion protein. The estrogen receptor keeps the Cree out of the nucleus. If you add tamoxifen, then the Cree can be uh, induced to go into the nucleus and delete genes. Um, and so uh, what we found is if we add tamoxifen to the cells, we can delete uh, G&E in muscles and also in pretty much all other organs of the body, uh, in, in particular liver. Uh, and so this is another more uh, global model that we can use to delete G&E uh, from uh, uh, cells. Uh, and um, so we have only looked at a couple of mice with this uh, cross to the lox lox uh, phenotype uh, genotype, and um, and we've only looked at them at six to eight weeks post treatment. Uh, and I have to say that at that point we can see almost complete knockdown of gene expression in the liver and in the spleen and the intestine, but we see. Uh, less than we would like in terms of downregulation of uh, g and &E in muscles, although downregulation in the gastroc here is identical, basically, to what we got with the AAB experiment. But at six to eight weeks, we don't see any muscle damage yet in, in these mice. Um, so uh, uh, it's unclear to us if we just haven't deleted enough of the gene to see phenotypes in, in this mouse model yet or if we need to let it go for longer. And we certainly have mice that are going for longer right now, um, but we uh, do not yet know um, whether they are going to be impaired or not. But in a perfect world, this would be the mouse we would use um, to study uh, gene therapy because we could actually delete uh, g and &E from all of the muscles of the body uh, very easily. So, so that's where we're at with, with these uh, experiments. Um, the key takeaways here is that we've developed a new potency assay to assess the human g and &E gene uh, and its potency and stability uh, when it's packaged into adeno-associated virus gene therapy vectors. Uh, we've defined the dose of human g and &E gene therapy that one needs to replace normal gene expression in skeletal muscle and shown that this can be 10 times lower than what is currently being used uh, to treat other forms of muscular dystrophy. Uh, and lastly, we've developed an inducible GE &E knockout mouse, which may be helpful for providing proof of concept studies to prove that gene therapy uh, is effective uh, in, in, in modeling uh, cure, curing the disease. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, speak to you about this. And we're looking forward to um, continuing to make progress uh, in these areas. Uh, thank you, Paul. A very interesting talk. Some uh, very exciting data there in a lot of different ways. So thank you for that. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Uh, that you should have access to that at the bottom of your screen. You can type them in. And I'd be happy to bring those up to Paul and hear, and hear his answer. While that's coming in, uh, I, I thought that was really exciting data about the dose response, particularly if we're looking at it, uh, the necessity of uh, an estimate that you could get almost uh, 10 times better uh, transduction there. Uh, I was kind of curious though, most of the, uh, well, actually, I guess the first question is all the expression data you're showing is on uh, RNA levels, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we don't we don't know the protein effects, and I mean there's there's certainly some data out there that suggests there's not always a strong correlation between, and not just for GNE but other things as well, but but particularly for GNE between the RNA level and the protein level. Uh, so, uh, what what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think there's going to be a good correlation there? I mean, obviously it's probably the same trend, but but what do you think? Um, do th do we need more confirmation on the protein level there? Um. So what we would need to do um, since g and &E as a protein is negatively regulated by its own sub uh, product, um, right. 
you can't really overexpress the protein beyond wild type levels and get a lot of sialic acid, additional sialic acid that's made. Um, so um, the, these inducible G and E gene knockout mice would be an excellent opportunity um, to um, prove that uh, the RNA dosing is correct in terms of fixing the actual synthesis of sialic acid um, in uh, the tissues in question. Um, and that's, I think, what we would need to do um, to answer your question. Right. But uh, you're, you're proposing that you'd be swapping out, uh, basically by expressing the, the wild type version, that'd be swapping out some of the mutated version that was present in the cells. And yes. That, with that yeah. regulation taking place. Yeah. In, in, theory, in theory, you really only need half the amount of uh, expression that is present in the patient because uh, it's a recessive disease. So um, if you could provide one normal copy out of two, um, you in theory should stop the disease from happening. But we decided it would be simpler to think about it in terms of a one-to-one -one, uh, so that especially if we go into a gene deletion mouse, we can actually show that we've completely fixed uh, normal function. Right, no, I'd agree with that. Uh, and since you brought up the mouse, a very exciting results there, at least with the, the CMB overexpression in with Cree, <clears throat> leading to an interesting muscle pathology there. So I, I noted there were a lot of central nuclei. And so do you, is that, do you have damage and it's being effectively regenerated there? Is that uh, your interpretation of what's going on? Yes, we can see regenerating fibers in, um, in those muscles. Uh, so that's, you know, we would actually need to do sort of a stepwise, uh, experiment where we looked every two weeks to really understand when that process is happening and, 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 uh, how, how, how it's really going. Uh, but I think, uh, that's the most likely explanation of what's happening. Yes. Yeah, it's certainly, certainly seemed that way, but that's exciting to see that there. So the interpretation that you have is that you're expressing in other tissues with the CMB promoter there, uh, which I mean, that makes perfect sense based on your dosing too. But if you're looking at the, so do you think you're hitting the motor neurons there? What, what, what other tissue, or are you hitting like other tissues and you're getting more sialic acid produced elsewhere and it's being scavenged? I mean, so no, I mean, that's a great question. And that's kind of a, a fascinating question, I think for me and for everybody is, you know, uh, and one that really has to be answered is, you know, where is all the sialic acid coming from? Is it all coming from muscle or is it, uh, is the liver providing sialic acid? I mean, Kelly's uh, thesis uh, and paper clearly showed that overexpressing uh, GE in the liver could induce expression of sialic acid in muscle. And we've seen that in other uh, experiments as well, where liver expression uh, over the num over a number of months, mind you, not just immediately, uh, can load a lot of uh, sialic acid into muscle. So um, it's going to be a very complex system, I think, to understand, uh, and it uh, will take uh, some rather sophisticated experiments to delineate those all of those questions. I would I would certainly agree with that. Um, certainly interesting though. So with the uh, Rosa over uh, Rosa body wide knockout. So the I, I guess you're just beginning to characterize those, but uh, you would think there would be some sort of regenerative phenotype. You might be able to see that at six to eight weeks. But I guess you're not stressing these animals in any significant way. That's that's true. These are just sitting in the cage, right? Right, we're not putting them on a treadmill. Uh, we did run these on a treadmill for a week, uh, and they were fine. Um, so uh, before they were um, euthanized, uh, and uh, we certainly did that um, with some, but not all of the AAV injected ones as well. Um, so uh, that didn't seem to to bother them. Uh, I think the question there is uh, one of timing. And you know, will we see uh, a different phenotype uh, when we extend uh, the deletion out 
twice as long. If we do see that, which is what we saw with the AAV, right? Um, so if we could reach that time point where we saw a pathology with the AAV and we could see that with the ROSA 26, then those will become a really fascinating model to look at um, the ontology of disease. Um, you know, we'll be able to sort of um, look at what things happen first and what things lead to, to, to other things. Um, it also is possible that we just didn't delete enough of the gene. <laughs> and that what we'll find is that when we go longer with these mice, uh, that we don't see any pathology, and then we'll have to sort of start over and work on ways to make that gene deletion more profound. And there are plenty of ways to do that. Um, and uh, uh, we'll just take that when it comes. Yeah, I was wondering, what, you know, it's difficult, you know, apples and oranges to some extent, but the level of knockdown you were seeing with the, with the Rosa Cree was that comparable to the knockdown? You know, it wasn't on different axes, I know that, but like the, uh, was it kind of comparable to the percentage knockdown you were seeing with your overexpression with AAV? Just, I guess, there were really, other spots, and, I couldn't really see that. Certainly there were data points that were comparable. Uh, mm -hmm. But generally, it was slightly uh, higher on average, maybe 10% more ex uh, expression, uh, like a 10% less knockdown uh, than in the AAV Cree experiments. Um, so, so, you know, we can, um, uh, we can actually uh, breed that transgene to homozygosity, which uh, is not uncommon in these sorts of experiments, uh, to give us more Cree. Uh, and also um, uh, bolus with tamoxifen more frequently to see if we can actually um, knock those down further. I believe I, Dr. Leck had a question. Thank you. Um, do you. I guess, do your results imply that the focus of gene therapy should be in a non-muscle tissue um, in order to fix you know, given you're finding that a body-wide knock, uh, knockout results in the muscle phenotype, but the, the knockout of the muscle alone isn't sufficient, shouldn't we be targeting a different tissue then? And if so, can we narrow down which tissue by gradually, you know, introducing one by one, restoring genie, um, and then seeing what fixes the muscle phenotype, the muscle the centralized nuclei in, in all the muscles. Yeah, I think it's way too early um, to come to that conclusion. I mean, we did see small foci of muscle damage in the MCK muscles, but I would say it was, a, you know, one or 2% of the muscle, um, no more than one or one, one, one percent. So, I mean, there was, uh, you know, an insignificant amount of muscle damage, but certainly there was something um uh that you might take to mean that muscle deletion alone eventually would give you the disease um and you know we would have to go for a much longer time to know whether that's true or not um our goal really is all about trying to get a model that is both robust and fast um and so in doing so, we might gloss over a few of those issues that may be important. Um, uh, so it doesn't mean that muscle-specific expression might not cure the disease. I don't think we have enough data to say that one way or the other. Um, and it would take much longer gene deletion experiments to, um, to know the answer to that. Yeah, but I do think that expressing the mutant protein I like that idea and seeing if you can see the um, the inclusions um, and then maybe doing it systemically in different tissues to see um, maybe one of them <laughs> results in, in the muscle phenotype. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it'll be, I mean, one of the nice things about doing the dose response curve and understanding where normal expression is for the human gene. Mm -hmm is that we can actually then introduce the mutant uh, gene at that level, which is uh, because, you know, it'll, it will have enzyme activity. And so you'll be potentially fixing the muscle from its deficit. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're expressing the, sure. 
yin protein. So it's a kind of a tricky experiment um, because you don't, what you'd really like to do is just express the mutant protein and see if deficit allowed it to behave differently. Um, so it's, it's uh, like, for example, then it would aggregate um, in the absence of uh, sialic acid. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I'd like, I, we will do that experiment and I, I'm hopeful that we'll learn something from it, but I, I think there are some confounding factors um, that um, make it difficult to interpret. Okay. Excellent. I, I see no other questions on the board and we are a bit over our scheduled time. So in the interest of everybody's time, I am going to, uh, bring this discussion to a close, but as we already talked about, very exciting data from Dr. Martin's lab. Thank you for uh, for walking us through that uh, and we greatly appreciate it. I'll, uh, just another great example of the, uh, of the research that's being uh, done across the world uh, in GNEM and the excitement that uh, is coming from seeing both new models for testing gene therapies and here we see direct application of potential gene therapies to treat uh, GNE myopathy. I also put in a plug for an upcoming uh, next session in our GNEM speaker series. That's from Dr. Francis Rosignol at the, at the NIH, uh, who will be presenting uh, sort of a status report for the ongoing MANIC trial, uh, supplementation therapy trial. This talk will be on MANIC as a potential therapy for GNA myopathy, advances and future directions. And he'll be speaking on December 18th at 9 a.m. in uh, Pacific time. Uh, we will, of course, be uh, uh, broadcasting that. Uh, I will not be here. Actually, Dr. Leck will be taking over for, uh, for that session, but we will be recording it as we usually do. So hopefully we can see some of you there. But otherwise, uh, thanks again to Dr. Martin, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.